This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us. With me today is friend of the show, John Cameron, and longtime co-host over there, Richard Fields. Gentlemen, the World Health Organization is, is fed up with the lockdowns as I am of the campaign trail. <laughs> John, what do you think about that? Well, um, they're um, finally uh, making a statement about, um, you know, the, um, the ill effects of the pandemic on the world. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, but something like 150 million well there's there's a there's a Barrington document out there Barrington something where uh, three internationally renowned um, public health people whose specialty is basically fighting um, uh, pandemics and epidemics um, one from Stanford one from Oxford and one from Harvard had a little meeting and they've already got 22,000 um, uh, medical professionals sign in it. And they're basically saying that, that they threw uh, standard healthcare practice out the window with this pandemic. And what you do is that you, you lock down and then you figure out what's going on and then you address the issues. And one of the points they came back to over and over and over again was that uh, the, the collateral damage to this is way worse than the damage from it. Uh, they didn't say that in so many words, but, um, and the the uh, um, the the special envoy for COVID for who is basically saying the same thing that um, the loss of jobs and loss of livelihood and the the horrible effect it's having on the, the poor people of the world uh, means that this this overall uh, shotgun approach is isn't working um, and need to uh, uh, need to get rid of these uh, complete lockdowns. And then the people at the Barrington Group said, um, basically, um, young people are 1,000 times less likely to have um, ill health effects from, from this virus as old people. And so what we need to do is, is focus on uh, protecting old people and people who are at risk because of, of comorbidities, although they didn't say comorbidities, and let kids go back to school and young people go to college. And and because right now um, they're saying that 130 million people could die from starvation because of the ill effects of this, the way this pandemic has crushed the world economy filtering down to the poorest of the poor. And I said that that's, that's not, you know, it's morally reprehensible and, and you need to treat it like any, they would have treated any other uh, epidemic, which is figure out who's at risk, which they have now, and it's old people and people with suppressed immune systems and comorbidities, who's not at risk, which is young, healthy people, or basically even young people who aren't so healthy and, and uh, protect the people who are at risk, people in old folks' homes, uh, people of Richard's age. <laughs> well, my age, too, really. I mean, what Well, the I'm hell? getting there. I'm and, getting there. But, and, and, uh, and let the world, uh, let those people develop um, um, antibodies, you know, herd immunity. Now, I don't think who is talking about herd immunity, but everybody else is now. And, and so treat the, treat this thing as if they would have treated anything else, which is uh, you can't, you know, if you're looking at world health, that you can't just look at one part of it and ignore everything else. Um, yeah, you have to the, look at Sweden and Belgium, where we took a more holistic approach to the whole yeah. issue. They didn't just focus on, okay, this is just a medical issue. It's an economic, it's a mental health mm -hmm. issue, it's a cultural and social issue. And they factored, they got scientists from all these various groups together and discussed a, a way through it that wouldn't destroy everything that they've already built. And unlike, you know, a lot of other countries like we've done here, we've just destroyed people's lives because we decided that we weren't going to have a sophisticated approach. Yeah. It's, it's encouraging to me that uh, who 
uh, in kind of a, an understated way, has admitted that they were wrong from the outset. And uh, yeah. but that's that's a step in the right direction. I'm glad they've admitted it, and I'm glad that uh, uh, more and more people are figuring out that we have a problem of uh, overreaction to COVID than we have a COVID problem. Yeah, it, it's not saying that COVID isn't an issue. I don't think a lot of times when every time you talk about you know dealing with it differently, everybody says, "Oh, well, you think it's a hoax?" No, it's real. But we had became so fixated on the target that we forgot the surrounding environment. And I think the thing that also to remember is that the people who uh, have led us into this uh, overreaction are old people. Uh, Fauci is uh, in his uh, 70s or 80s, I forget, he's, he's an old guy. Uh, just coincidentally, he is the, the highest paid person in the federal government. He makes more money than the president or, or anybody else. He is actually the highest paid person working for the federal government. So, you know, he's protecting his own interest because it's old people that affect, uh, that it affects. So he's protecting himself and his cohorts. Uh, and uh, same way with politicians in most countries are old people. So they're protecting themselves and uh, saying to hell with uh, people that are uh, younger, in, in effect. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, the one thing I know we with the, the the subject is the who has stated this, but that that Barrington the Barrington Declaration is very interesting, in that the three doctors on the panel, and if you get a chance to look at, I think the, the email I sent to the to the group uh, has a link where you can watch a video where this uh, guy is interviewing them. Uh, the uh, the U.S. guy, the Stanford guy, that's taken so much flack talking about how. Because uh, he, he's the one that came out at the beginning and said we're approaching this this all wrong and and uh, um, you know basically it looks like a whole bunch of people way more people have this and have been exposed to it than we think and there are no bad health outcomes and he he threw out a statistic or the the Swedish guy who's from I think uh, where's he from Harvard um, threw out the statistic and he said more young people have died from um, from the flu during this period of time than have died from COVID. And so, um, you know, that just this, and, and you know, that they say about government programs that one size fits all, but I wish what we'd say about government run programs is one size fits none, because it, it really, uh, you know, and the, the guy from Sweden, he was involved in, in their process of, you know, they're not even wearing masks in Sweden unless people choose to, uh, you know, they've, they've even on buses, which yeah. and they're, they, they weren't even wearing, they don't even mandate mask on buses. And they, and they said flat out, yeah, we, we, we messed up on, on care homes in Stockholm at the beginning. And if you pull those numbers out of the Swedish model, they're as low as Norway and, and Finland or the other, like New York times came out with some, <clears throat> brouhaha and said, oh, Sweden's done a horrible job compared to his neighbors, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at um, the economic consequences, and then, you know, with, with, the, with all of these, these so-called experts are pointing out, there's all these industrialized countries and what's happening in them. Let's, let's talk about the collateral damage. What's the collateral damage? Um, and that collateral damage is literally 100 million people starving to death. And, and if you're, unless you're a a sociopath. Um, maybe that's not the wrong argument to take because we know a lot of people in politics are. Then, then you can't just ignore that and concentrate on on uh, you know keeping y your kids out of school because you're paranoid or or even I know like your your grandmother. These are all really important people. But my God, if you have any kind of soul at all or any kind of moral compass at all. You have to look at what's happening, not only to the current generation of poor, but a whole another group is pushed into poor. And this is the worst kind of poverty, poverty that ends in death for many of these people. And you have to look at the consequences financially to uh, not only the current generation, but generations to come with this, with this huge debt burden that's being thrown on the world because of attempts to keep this lockdown in place. And keep people happy. So, um, you know, the who didn't say all that. Basically, they just said these, these, you know, dr I think he even used the word draconian lockdowns yeah, are, are not the way to deal with this. And, and, and if you could, you know, put truth serum in anybody who's in public health uh, and ask them how to deal with a, uh, a pandemic, this wouldn't be the way to do it. And now that we actually <clears throat> have information 
about who's at risk, who will get real sick, and who won't. We're going to be intelligent. I'm done. I've talked too much. Sorry. Meanwhile, we've got Kamala Harris in the uh, in, in the, uh, the, the Supreme Court confirmation hearing saying that it's irresponsible for us to be holding these hearings. I think there's a, a, a heck of a lot to be said for a uh, unstated, un, uh, enunciated plot on the part of the Democratic Party to keep this issue uh, alive and, and, and stoke the maximum amount of fear uh, as an election tactic. Yeah, and for me, and for me, the emotional uh, aspect of this. I saw an article just the other day about um, a protest at an old folks' home where the where the old people out in their wheelchairs were out holding their protest signs saying to end the lockdown because he'd rather die of COVID than loneliness. And the emotional impact and the emotional impact that this is having on people is unconscionable, and it it goes farther than we actually like to to imagine. Um, there was an article in the B this morning. I know I throw this guy's on you late that a surge in domestic violence. The, the, they were talking about how it's saving the bail bond industry, but they're not talking about how the surge in domestic violence is coming on the heels of these lockdowns, both the economic stress and, and the emotional stress of the lockdowns. The constant fear is pushing people over the edge who normally wouldn't be that close to the edge. Hmm. Yeah. Drug abuse is skyrocketing. Alcohol abuse is skyrocketing. The beer industry and the whiskey industry is having a record year, and the and the pot industry. I mean, you can't the, all these dispensaries in town, from what I hear, can't keep product on their shelves, uh, and uh, so. But I I heard uh, what do you call it? It's just kind of word of mouth. Anecdotally, I was talking to a guy, and and I've, well, I've talked to a couple of people who either know cops or married to cops or living with cops. And they're saying that domestic uh, violence calls or domestic uh, disturbance calls are like five to ten times what they were before the lockdown. And when you think about it, you know, people are, are, uh, are used to, well, people who are isolated are missing touch and social interaction. They call it social distancing, but it's physical distancing. And, and human beings are designed to, to touch and, and hold and be held and see people. The generations are, de are, are designed, whether you think it's a creator that designed them or, or, or Darwinian evolution, um, to be part of a group and interact and socialize. And, and people aren't, and, uh, unless you're that rare person that loves being a hermit, aren't designed to, to live in isolation with just electronic media which is basically bombarding them with, with horror stories and making them fearful. You know, this is really, if you wanted to design something that would destroy this, the cultural fiber of a society, what we're doing to people right now would be it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's horrible. And, we, and thank God, or thank whoever, uh, that, the, the, that who, and I have a lot of problems with World Health Organization top to bottom, but you know, they've, they've come right out and said, and the major news media, this should be the lead in every newspaper, the top of every blog, and every website in, in the world right now. And is it? No, uh, it is not. Um, they have said that we have to more It will be after November 3rd. Oh, yeah. On, 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 November, on November 4th, well, no, it'll be in January 22nd. Well, depending on who wins. On November 4th, we'll, uh, they'll fight it tooth and nail if the Democratic Party happens to lose and, and eventually do the rational thing, maybe. Um, if the, the Democratic Party wins, then they'll be fighting tooth and nail, wins the White House, to have it happen as soon as they possibly can and act as if they wanted it to happen all along. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of the, the guy that's the president. I'm not, a, I don't see why we need a freaking president. I mean, um, and I think, I think we, we entered into a, a general overall discussion of every single horror we're talking about, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's crushing the world. It's either government created or, or, or mismanagement's made us worse. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just talking over people. Yeah. So let's make it worse. Um, 
Well, assuming Biden wins the election, it looks like he wants Sally Yates for the attorney general. And for those of us here on the social justice side who, who you know, basic human rights, it's just like, how is this even possible? Sally Yates was the person uh, working in the Justice Department, working for the AG uh, as a deputy AG under Obama. And Obama put in, in place a clemency program to uh, get people out of prison who deserve to be out of prison. And she uh, essentially uh, slowed the pro slow walked the whole process uh, to make sure the people stayed in prison, mm -hmm. and uh, was a whistleblower in the Obama administration called her out on it. And uh, so that's the person that Biden has selected to be uh, the not just deputy attorney general but attorney general. We're talking about the guy that uh, authored the 1994 crime bill, which. Uh, disproportionately puts blacks in prison uh, and drug users in prison and all that. Uh, we're talking about Kamala Harris, who prosecuted uh, to the fullest extent possible all of the uh, draconian uh, uh, legislation that, uh, that Biden originated. We're talking about people, two people who are largely 100% responsible for a lot of what happened in the riots in the streets this summer talking about those two people being elected and they're uh, claiming the, the, the mantle of social justice. That's it. That's that it's, 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 it's laughably backward. Well, it's no, I, it's, it, it's not laughable because it's, it's a horror story. I it's mean, tragically it's, backwards. It's, it's, it's where it's Kafka esque. Uh, and I don't know. I think Kafka's no, cause some of Kafka's stuff is actually funny. It's it feels ninety four ish, nineteen eighty four ish, where you know one country is the enemy and evil, and the very next day they're the allies and good, and so um, you know the idea that 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 these two, I mean, I, I had a brief discussion with a young lady who's a big Kamala Harris fan because she's so strong, and I I said to her, and this shows you what people think of DAs and 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 people who work. In the criminal justice in side and in, in in the government, I, I explained to her. Well, I said, "Are you aware that uh, in in two cases um, that I know of, uh, Kamala Harris withheld exculpatory evidence in capital crimes?" And she said, "Oh, she said that's what DAs do." And I went, "What?" And I thought. So you are going to vote for someone who basically tried to murder two people. Uh, and then I talked to another guy who's like, don't want to mention his name. Uh, had a big lobbying firm in Sacramento and mentioned that to him. And he said, Oh no, no, that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You would be, you'd be, you wouldn't even believe the things that woman has done. So if, she is. I mean, we were talking about politicians being sociopaths. She's in the dictionary as a sociopath. I think her picture is actually, not a sociopath. if not, it should be. And this is this is the woman who's really is going to be president of the United States. And and you know anybody who would you know come out and say as presidential candidate that the American public doesn't deserve to know his uh, uh, his views on whether or not he would uh, uh, stack the court or whatever it was. I mean. This is just, this is, if you would have shown this picture of the American political spectrum to people 20 years ago, and you have to explain it to them, they wouldn't believe you. If you tried to pitch this as a fiction novel uh, and an a, a acquisitions editor would turn it down, this, this stuff is patently insane. Crazy. We have an evil on the left. We have a clown on the right. Joe Jorgensen gets uh, my vote. I've already voted. Have you? Hmm. Well, well, not yet. But I have. I have a little pack of paper here. As a matter of fact, I think I have twenty-three votes that I can cast. No, I'm kidding, folks. I just have one. But uh, hey, we've we've to be three times apparently. I get hmm. to vote for Jorgensen, Trump, and Biden all just by voting for Jorgensen. So why wouldn't you? Hmm. Right. I get three votes just by voting once. That's what, that's what I keep being told. But talking about three votes in once, let's move to China. We've had new food issues in China. I think one of the little unknown things is China can't actually feed itself, can they? Well, well not, not I think like it's a little, bit, a little bit misleading for, for the simple reason that uh, 
China was in abject famine as, as recently as 30 or 40 years ago under Mao. And for the most part, they have been feeding themselves. Now, uh, they are subject to weather and natural disasters and so forth. And they've had a, a plethora of, uh, of bad weather and pestilence and that sort of thing in the, in the last year or two. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's totally understandable that they would have periods of time when they would need to purchase more uh, foodstuffs than they would normally. And I think that's the phase that they're in right now. I say hooray for the fact that uh, China has gone as capitalist as they have in terms of uh, business uh, taking place, and they're and and the, and they're doing business with the rest of the world to buy the soybeans and the corn and the wheat that they need to feed their population. Nobody's going hungry in China, uh, un, uh, unlike a lot of other countries where uh, the coronavirus shutdown is making people go hungry. China is actually doing a quite a good job of feeding feeding its people, in spite of the fact that they've had bad weather. Well, I. I... Yes and no. I, I, I agree that there's a huge, uh, a huge improvement in the well-being of uh, Chinese citizenry. Um, I also think there's a di direct correlation uh, with uh, Chinese foreign policy and internal problems. And I think the, the, you know, the problem with, that they're having with their food supply right now and the fact that uh, there there are hints that there's ra there is rationing in some areas of China, although there was rationing in my local Safeway due to the stupidity of this coronavirus here. Um, I mean, couldn't even get toilet paper for God's sake. Um, and there's at least 162 million dead trees in California that would make really good toilet paper. We could toilet paper the world. So I I I. Um, compared to the to the mismanagement, government sponsored mismanagement that caused um, somewhere between sixteen and forty five million Chinese people to starve to death during the Great Famine, which was in 1951, 52, something like that, um, before I was born. Well, fifty one was. Um, you know, they're they're doing swimmingly well, and economically, they're doing wonderfully well. That, that, that when you have 1.2 billion people um, and you have a major glitch and the rest of the world is, is mismanaging uh, a pandemic, then you know, it can lead to things which might cause uh, politicians to, to look uh, outward for, for something to distract, shall we say. And I think that might be worth looking at. Well, you know, I think the rising they're... standard of living I think the rise yeah. comes with an increased consumption of food. Oh, so yeah. Chinese, yeah, by, def by definition, because if you, as a rising center of living, people want to eat more meat. Meat is a less, a less efficient way of uh, bringing uh, in carbohydrates and protein uh, into the human body than plant-based diets uh, are. So, you know, it just takes more agricultural production to support a meat-eating diet. And they're moving in, in the direction of more meat. Well, I, yeah. I agree. I thought you, but my what the point I wanted to raise, and uh, maybe I didn't do a good job of it. I seem to be rambling today. Maybe I have COVID brain fog. I don't know. Um, is uh, that uh, they sure seem to be doing an awful lot of saber rattling? And typically, when you're having internal strife mm -hmm. in in countries, whether it's uh, you know whether it's natural disasters, and they're you know you're worried about your food supply chain or whether it's uh, people getting a little uppity, as we, we don't see uh, in, the, in the lamestream media. But, you know, there are, um, you know, Hong Kong has is, is always been kind of the, the bleeding edge of what's happening inside China, even though Hong Kong's in, external to it. And, and you know, they... they the, Not anymore. Yeah. Well, it's the... It's the well, yeah, and, and uh, to that point, yeah, they're, they're also doing uh, exercises and publicizing doing exercises for an invasion of Taiwan. Of Taiwan. Uh, I think it's partly, I think you're right, John, it's partly a part of, uh, of uh, finding an external devil to blame uh, the internal woes on, but it's also uh, the Chinese leadership taking a look at the uh, uh, breakdown in politics in the U.S. and uh, uh, elsewhere around the world and saying, you know, this might be our chance to make, uh, to make our move. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. think, yeah, if it, when people are, are 
are as distracted as they are by by the I think really the only the only thing standing in the way of of you know and like we have an empire so I I can't I don't see how Americans can begrudge anybody else trying to establish an empire when we had troops at one time in a 170 different countries and you know, basically had a huge stockpile of nuclear weapons and didn't want anybody else to have any. Um, you know, I can't, I can't understand how we could be upset about another country wanting to do the same thing. But it sure feels like they're, they're, you know, pushing and shoving and, and, and sticking their head up to see how the world's reacting to it. And if, you know, if you can get away with something, you're going to keep getting away with it. You know, and that's what bullies do. That's what we did for years. You know, we would just go into these countries and and decide who the president was going to be and what the, what the form of government was going to be. And, you know, who was going to get the oil and who was going to get the, the mineral rights. And, you know, the Brits did it before we did and the French and the Belgians did it and it's empire building. And so, but you know, when you have some internal stuff going on, it's, it's waving that red flag outside your country has a tendency to distract the citizenry. I mean, our, our president does it by making uh, immigrants the bad guy over and over and over again. So, you know, what the hell? Scary times. But it's way harder to invade countries than people think. Um, you know, especially uh, uh, Taiwan or Formosa, or whatever you want to call it, is a highly industrialized, mountainous country with a heck of a, it's admittedly it's small, army, navy, air force. Uh, I that's a tough nut. You know, I'm, I'm, you, you have, I think you, you know, their countries are way easier to wipe out than they are. Well, the, the thing about invading Taiwan is you would not have much left of value after the invasion, uh, yeah. if it was successful, had been accomplished. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's not like, you know, if you, if you, you know, when you invade Afghanistan, you actually bomb their standard of living up. But uh, if you, you know, if you do that in, all the tech factories that are in Formosa or Taiwan or whatever you want to call it and all the rest of that. But the, you know, the, the, the political view China's flat out says that it's part of uh, it's a wayward part of China. And one day we're going to take it back, you know, and they just keep saying yeah. that. So yeah, you know. well, China does not uh, like to play well with their ancient history. Now they like want to, you know, they claim it, this uh, Island is theirs and they want it. They probably want Korea back. If you, if you actually ask them. Yeah. Got him to well, give you an honest just, moment. Uh, if they could shove North Korea to the side and have South Korea, it'd be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, um, would, yeah, we'd all like to shove South Korea to the side. I mean, North Korea to the side and just have South Korea, but we don't get to do that. And that is all the time we have for the day. You can visit us at libertariancounterpoint.com. You can find us at Facebook at Facebook slash the libertarian counterpoint. You can find us on all the various social media aspects. And channel 17 at 8 o'clock. And what are the other time slots, Richard? Do you remember? Yeah, Four 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, what is it? Uh, 11 a.m. on Friday morning. And I think it's 4 a.m. on Saturday morning. And you, can count, and you can count the Libertarian Counterpoint podcast. They, they have an episode once a week somewhere along the schedule. It pops up whenever they find a spot. And thank you for joining us. And please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.